الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Behind enemy lines. A very intriguing topic. In 1991, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And Saudi Arabia, fearing the invasion of its own kingdom, invited half a million American troops into the country. They concentrated in the eastern province, Khobar, Dammam. And as they prepared to decimate the Iraqi military, a soldier from the Saudi uh, military, a sergeant, began to develop a close relationship with some of the Americans. He didn't know very much English, but he was just a friendly kind of a guy. So he mixed with them, uh, he took them into town to get things that they needed, etc. He even slept in the tents with them. His intention was dawah. When he was able to befriend a sufficient amount of them, it was now time to actually present something to them. Because they were asking him about Islam, but he couldn't explain very much to them because his English was just too weak. So he sought me out. I was in Riyadh at the time and uh, brought me to the American camps. And they arranged some open sessions for the troops who wanted to ask questions about Islam. Before addressing their questions, I gave them a brief idea about what Islam is. Basic teachings, not real dawah in the sense of comparative, getting into Bible and these kinds of things, just presenting what is Islam. But keeping in mind that they were Westerners and the way that Westerners think, I presented it according to that. In the course of these presentations, a couple of them accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. But we didn't have very much time because the war then began shortly after my first visits. 
After the war was over, and it was quite short, the troops had to be processed out of Saudi Arabia and back to the US. You now had half a million troops and it was going to take time to get them out. So they moved them from a tented area that they were in before into some uh, towered areas that had been built many years before, a region they called them Hobart Towers. This, these buildings had been built, huge high rise, uh, 20 stories, 25 story building, but enough to make up what would have been a community, quite a large area. And these had been built originally for Bedouins. The idea was to bring them in off the desert and settle them. And after the government built them up and everything, the Bedouins came in and looked around, checked them out, said, no, no, we don't want this. We prefer to live out in the desert the way we're living. And they built these outside of Jiddah and other parts. And they were unanimous in not living there. So they remained empty for years, just sitting there. So the American troops were put in there. They occupied that area. And there was a huge um, open area. The buildings were all around. There's an open area there. And in that open area, between the buildings, uh, various businesses, you know, Saudi entrepreneurs, wanting to sell gold jewelry, t-shirts, everything. They came, they set up tents here, there, and everywhere, right? And um, we requested that we get a tent also for just presenting the message. The tent was called, it was quite large, you know, it was almost the length of this uh, masjid here. It was called, had a big label on the side, it was called the Saudi Arabian Cultural Information Tent. Right? We are going to explain Saudi culture. And uh, the American military authorities, they are very happy to facilitate it for us because it couldn't happen without their permission. Uh, because the people were there and it was going to take time for them to be processed out the country. So anything that could be done to keep them occupied, they were in favor of, they were supportive of. Because usually when uh, American troops go into a country, whether it's the Philippines, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Thailand, they go into these places, they turn the country or the, the neighboring areas into brothels. You know? They have money. The women of that area would then prostitute themselves. This would be an R&R &R situation for the American troops. That was the norm. And of course, it wasn't happening in Saudi Arabia. It just wasn't happening. There are no women available. You know, you know. So they had to do some things to keep these guys occupied. So we set up the tent. Alhamdulillah, we got a team together of other American brothers and we began the process of giving da'wah to them behind enemy lines. How did we set up the tent? When you first came in the tent, from this side, say for example, this is the main entrance, 
they'd come in. We had a series of tables with books about Saudi Arabian culture, about the desert, about the animals, about the dress of the people, and all these types of books. In the middle of the books, there would be some what is Islam pamphlets and booklets there. And after that, we had another table where we had uh, Qurans in English. Because we noted that many of them had wanted to get copies of the Quran. They wanted to take it back as a souvenir. You know, when you're going to different countries, as tourists, you want to take back a souvenir from the country. Something when you come back, your friends ask, okay, so what did you bring back? They can say, right, this, uh, I got this uh, book. It's their holy book. I brought it back. Some people actually objected. They said, no, we can't give these people the Quran. Of course, it's, English, it's translated. They were translated versions. Some of them had Arabic texts also. And um, of course, the scholars had already identified what constitutes Quran and what doesn't constitute Quran. The basic definition that they made was where the words of Allah are less than the words of man, it is no longer considered Quran. Because the term Quran can reverse, refer to a verse, a group of verses, a surah, or the whole Quran. So this is what they said was the distinguishing point. What distinguished between tafsir and Quran? Because the issues of wudu, being in a state of wudu with Quran, giving it to non-Muslims, this was a critical point to understand. So, many of them came and they bought copies of the Quran. We sold it to them. Not for profit, it wasn't a business, it was just making it available, cover the costs. Maybe anywhere from around 80,000 copies were sold. 60, 70, 80,000 in that region were sold. They took it back home with them. And we know, we expected, the majority of them would never read it. They would just put it in the shelf, you know, as a curiosity piece, which they could point to when their friends asked them, so what did you bring back from Saudi Arabia? And we were okay with that because there have been a number of cases of people who became Muslims simply by coming across a Quran at a time when their curiosity was open and they took that advantage. So we figured, okay, he puts it in his house. Maybe his wife will read it. Maybe his kid will read it. Maybe his father when he comes over to visit. Or maybe a generation later, somebody will pick it up and open it. We said at least we got it into the home. Then we had some stands where they would come and sit, you know. And we had a brother from New York who called himself the Latin from Manhattan. Right? He was a former radio announcer. So he knew how to warm up listeners, right? So that's what he would do, because they would all come in, you know, these are all military people. They're coming in, groups of them. They're curious, but at the same time, they're a little suspicious, you know, a little uneasy. Maybe an Iraqi might come running in with a bomb and blow himself up, you know, or something. So 
he would then begin to warm them up. He would chat with them, play with them, joke with them till they felt comfortable. Okay, there. Okay, this is all right. We can relate to him, you know. Then uh, I would come in, and there was sort of like a mat and a uh, Saudi majlis on the ground there. And I would sit there, and I would give the same basic introduction to Islam, what Islam is, basic teachings, brief. Then we would just throw the floor open to questions. They could ask anything they wanted to ask. No limitations. You don't have to be on the topic. Anything that comes to your head. And Americans are very curious. You know, we tried to do this with the British, but they didn't even allow us into the British areas. British officers, no. Not interested. Americans, they're more open, curious. Yeah. So, alhamdulillah, it's good. Actually, one of the things we did, we made a skit. It was called, and we recorded it, it was a cassette, it's called Saudi Culture. And in it, a American was brought into a Saudi's home. This is the scene of this skit. So he comes into the home and, you know, he chats with the host and um, there are a couple of us that are there in, in, engaged in the conversation with him. And it was done in a light, funny style. The American was played by a brother by the name of Hudayfa from Philadelphia. Uh, he, till today, has a program on Saudi TV, a uh, youth program, which he uh, does with uh, Saudi youth, you know, alhamdulillah. He's a funny guy. So he played the part of the curious American, you know, voicing their curiosity. And we had a Saudi brother whose English was pretty good. He would be responding and we would also back up and add other points. This was distributed amongst them to listen. This was also a means of acquainting them to Islam through the culture. Anyway, in the tent, as I said, we opened up for any questions they wanted. And they asked about everything. Of course, Many of them were shocked when they came to Saudi Arabia because they were coming thinking they were going to be in the middle of the desert, they would be seeing camels going by left and right, you know, at camel crossings, and, and they came, they saw all these cars and city built up and Burger King and McDonald's, and they said, what? What is this? You know, they were quite shocked. So they had a lot of curious questions to ask. And of course, sometimes we have to go back and do research to find out how to answer these questions. Among the questions that they asked was uh, why some uh, people wore red and white scarves, you know, the Ghotra, others wore black and white, All others only wore white. What, what, what is this? mean, you know. So, so we gave them the background, the different areas of the Arab world. They, these are just styles, but no real significant. Then they asked about the iqal that is worn on the scarves. When they first asked, and I said, okay, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, I went and I asked Saudi friends, where did this thing come from? All of the Saudi, they didn't have any answers. Nobody knew. We all we just wear it, you know. <laughs> we don't know where it came from. So eventually I got to talk with some of the elders and they were able to explain that, oh, this originally was 
the hobbling cord of the camel. I talked about it in Juma today. So they explained where it came from. And then, after you hobbled your camel, you need to get back on and ride. You had this hoop of rope. What to do with it? Twist it, put it on your head. Keeps your scarf in place as you're riding, you know, so it doesn't fly off your head. It's multi-purpose, right? So, alhamdulillah, they like that. Uh, they asked many questions. Sometimes they asked about uh, what they, they called uh, the BMOs. Uh, you all know about UFOs, right? UFO, unidentified flying objects. Well, they had developed this phrase they called BMOs, right? What are the BMOs? Black moving objects. <laughs> this was in reference to Saudi women who were wearing full abayas and they would just be moving. They would see them, oh boy, what was that? You know? <laughs> so they're curious you know, about these black moving objects. So we gave them the background and uh, we took them into Saudi homes. You know, the women, especially the women, would, would sit with them and get to know who was behind these uh, veils, right? And of course, they were shocked because we put them in the homes of Saudis who had uh, studied in the West so the women could speak good English, they were educated, you know, and they were living lives like queens. The, the women were just aghast. Wow, I wish I was like you, you know. You know, they were really impressed at how much the woman was honored and she had this position in the home and people looking after her, you know. Somebody to drive her wherever she needed to go. Then, we took groups of men into the masjids. At first, when we took the first group, we wanted to bring them into the masjid. They said, oh, no. We can't go in there. I said, why? I said, because the officers told us that we should not come within 30 meters of any mosque. Means you go walking around, don't go near these places. So that's what they told us. We said, no, it's okay. Oh, we got, we got orders. No, we can't do this. So we had to talk back with the officers, clarify it, and get the okay. Give them the okay. They can go in. So we started taking groups of them into the masjid. And of course, when we first took them into the masjid, you know, we tried to take them at times when, uh, in the morning, when people weren't praying there. But of course, Occasionally, some Saudis would come in and say, oh, what are these guys doing here? Kofar, Najis, get them out of the masjid. We had to, hold on, hold on, it's okay. <laughs> of course, we had to inform the imam, you know, listen, if these things happen, you got to control your people here, you know. Let them know that it is actually halal. It's not haram. In fact, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did it. He met uh, delegations in the masjid delegations of kuffar they came in the masjid he met with them he even tied up one of the prisoners from the battle of uh, I think it was Uhud tied him up in the masjid for three days and nights so it was but most people never heard about this they don't know it all we know is innam al uh, innam al you know this is it so we had to clarify this point. Anyway, they would come in, <coughs> take off their boots outside and come in, sit down, and we clarify for them, well, yes, you see, this is the mosque. We don't have an altar on which we slaughter Christians, in spite of what you've been told, right? We don't do human sacrifices in here, no. It's just a place of prayer. Right. Very simple. They were impressed. Because the masjids, Saudi Arabia in general, they're very plain. 
very plain. And actually, though we tend to look at the fancy masjids with all the colors and carvings and calligraphy and all these different things as being something really beautiful, the Prophet ﷺ had said that one of the signs of the last days would be the beautification of the masjids. You know, because that's not the purpose of the masjid. The masjid is for prayer, for remembering Allah. And Prophet ﷺ, when he used to wear garments which had lines or whatever on it, and it caught his attention, he, after the prayer, he gave away the garment. He didn't want things that would distract him from prayer. So even the rugs, right, with all these designs and things on it, this is actually counterproductive. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You stand there praying, you look and you see these lines and then they start to move and you... You think you see things crawling there and you know really the rug should be plain that is closer to the sunnah anyway point is they came in we explained to them about the different elements of the mosque the mihrab its purpose the mimbar the minaret we explained the different parts of the mosque and they would ask questions so how do you pray we showed them what do you say in your prayer we told them and they would stay until Zohar time and they would observe Salat al Zohar sitting at the back they observe Salat al Zohar and you know so many of them afterwards would come up to me and the other brothers and say you know we have seen real prayer you guys are really praying what we're doing back home in the church it's not prayer if you've ever seen the churches in America they have basically a disco atmosphere the minister is like the lead singer right he has a choir which is you know his backup singers and they got musical instruments in their guitar piano drums the whole shot you know and everybody's swaying and you know it's, it's and they call it prayer but these guys after seeing that seeing the calmness of the prayer the quiet of the masjid yeah, it left a big impression on them really we also in the course of explaining answering questions we had questions that would come up about Christianity because of course some of them were more practicing Christ Christians you know and they'd heard stories about Muslims and their beliefs and they would feel that yes we need to take the message of Christianity to these people so some of them would try to evangelize but whenever those kind of discussions would arise, I used to cut them short. If it was simple enough, I could give a few words, answer, response. Uh, I would do it. If it, I could see they want to get in deep, then we'd, I would stop it and say, listen, we had connected to our tent another tent, a smaller tent. I said, for those who want to get into deep, you know, religious discussion, then we have that other tent over there. So they would get up and they would go into that tent. They said, because, you know, I, and everybody was happy with that because most people really didn't want to get into deep religious discussions. They just were curious about 
what's going on in this country. What, what are the people like? Why do they all drive, you know, Nissan pickup trucks? Why? Why is it so common? Everybody seems to have a Nissan pickup truck. This was the favorite of the Bedouins, right? They like Nissan pickup trucks. So, in that tent, we had a brother from Sri Lanka. A big, tall brother with a huge beard. He had an interesting story. He was studying to be a minister, a Christian minister. And when he had finished a certain level of his studies, he was going to work in the field, to do some field work. And he chose what was supposed to be the most difficult field to do uh, evangelical work. He heard that the Arabs are the most difficult people to convert. Most difficult. They had been trying for years. They never managed to convert a single Saudi. So he is a bold kind of guy. He said, that's where I want to go. Right. So he went in as a, an accountant. He had training in accountancy. So he went in as an accountant. But of course, his main goal was da'wah. So when he got there, you know, he's getting accustomed, acclimated to the situation. He uh, decided he was better buy himself a Quran, you know, because he's got a big job ahead of him. He needs to know this book backwards and forwards. I mean, he'd studied it when he's doing the ministry studies. He had studied portions that had been presented to him by the, his teachers, his professors. But he wanted to get the book and read it from cover to cover, he said. So he got his Quran, and in the evening, after he finished work, he started reading. He read, and he read, and he read, till he finished the whole Quran. Not too many people read the whole Quran. I mean, from Fatiha to Nas. When he finished reading the Quran, he went looking for Muslims and said to them, I want to take Shahada. I want to be a Muslim. And they took him to one of the uh, Muslim brothers who took him to one of the offices and he took Shahada. He went up to Qasim for a while. They gave him some training, Islamic teaching, background. And then they turned him loose. And he was a Dawa dynamo. I mean, I'd never seen anybody like him. He used to come to Riyadh. And from the airport, he would take a taxi and come to my house, visit me before going into the city. I lived on the outskirts of Riyadh. And invariably, whenever he came, he would bring the taxi driver in with him to take Shahada. <laughs> From the airport to my place, he'd given him enough dawah, he's ready to take Shahada. Regularly. You know, he was, as I said, he was a dawah dynamo. And uh, he used to tell me, you know, he said, if the night came and I hadn't given the shahada, I felt uneasy. What, what did I do wrong? What did I miss out on today? This was Muhammad Sharif from Sri Lanka. So, when we put the team together out there in Dammam, 
khubar. We brought him along. And he was the one waiting in the tent. Right? And he used to have this big suitcase with him, right? So when the people would come in and they would sit down with him and they say, yeah, yeah, we want to talk about the gospel. You know, the Bible. So he said, okay, fine. Which Bible? They said, what? Which Bible you want to talk about? He said, the Bible. It's just one Bible. I said, no, there isn't. He would open up his suitcase and whip out for them about 15 different Bibles. They'd be, whoa, <laughs> we didn't know about that. And then from there, he would wipe them out. Those that didn't succumb to his dawah, they would say, we better go back and talk to our chaplain. Chaplain was the, um, the religious uh, representative from the different uh, religious groups as part of military, American military policy that they have religious, uh, you could call them religious guides or representatives. So each sect would have their representative, the major sects. Actually, they even had a representative for Satan worshipers. Yeah. yeah. There are recognized and accepted sect of worshipers in America. Satan, Satan worship. They have their own Bible called Satan's Bible. And uh, they had their representative there. Anyway, the point is that a number of them would go back and they would bring their chaplains to do battle with Muhammad Sharif. Alhamdulillah, in the course of our six months there, 11 chaplains gave shahada. Alhamdulillah. 11 chaplains took shahada. The numbers of people from our Dawa in the main tent started to grow the numbers of people who were accepting Islam. Two, three, five, ten, till we were hitting numbers like 20 a day. This continued half months. We ended up with over 3,000 people accepting Islam from the Saudi Arabian cultural information tent. <laughs> Of course, the tent became known very quickly as the conversion tent. <laughs> and the chaplains wanted to shut it down, you know, because the word spread. They wanted to stop it. But the officers, the senior officers, they said, no, you know, people are free. If they want to go, they go. It's their business. The only thing they could do is that Sometimes when they're walking by, they would have these, you know, uh, da'wah books, their da'wah books, and they would just walk by the entrance and throw it inside, keep walking, right? So sometimes in the course of lectures, we just see a book come flying in, you know. <laughs> That's all they could do, right? Alhamdulillah, some of them accepted Islam because when they were out on maneuvers, they would come across Bedouins out in the desert. You know, nobody for miles. They would come across this Bedouin there with his tent. He's got sheep, goats, whatever. And he would see them and they're all geared down. You know, they got their big packs and, you know, they're weapons and they're marching in there. and they would see him and he would say check check that side check that side maybe it's a trap whatever and he said, oh no it's just him by himself and they would come over sit down then he would take out some tea offer them dates heat up the tea give them some tea drink he doesn't know a word of English. 
Not like the brother, at least he knew a few words. These guys would know nothing, right? But just their, how they carried themselves, their hospitality was just enough. You know? Many of them told me afterwards, they said, you know, we have been stationed around the world and we have never experienced hospitality like this. Never. So friendly and, you know, it was just mind-blowing, mind-boggling for them. Usually when they deal with uh, societies that they land in, people are trying to make money off them, rip them off and whatever, they're haggling this, it's just, you know, nobody's inviting them into their home type situation. So it had a big impact on them too. So Alhamdulillah, that group went back to America and of course the troops, those who accepted Islam, they kept the da'wah going inside of the military itself. So their numbers multiplied and multiplied. When they went back to the States, they started an organization there called the MMM, Muslim Members of the Military, and eventually they requested Muslim chaplains. Their numbers were big enough that they had to be recognized. So you had Muslim chaplains were appointed for the army, for the navy, for the air force, you know. Big changes took place. Alhamdulillah, a couple of years later, whilst this process was going on, we know that Muslims in Bosnia were being slaughtered. The Serbs were wiping them out. And they were calling on the Muslim world to help them. Muslim world was unable to provide support for them. People sent in stuff through the Red Cross, food, medicines, etc. But to militarily support them, they couldn't. Unable. This was when some uh, Muslim brothers from different parts of the world went in and joined them, fought along with them. Well, some of those Americans who returned home and left the American military came together, formed A-teams of specialists, went back into Bosnia, trained the Bosnians, and fought alongside them till the war was over. Allahu Akbar. They originally came to America, from America to Saudi Arabia with one purpose, and Allah brought them back, brought them into Islam and brought them back to the Muslim world to help Muslims defend themselves. This is the greatness of Allah. The lesson that we have to take from this is that we have to look at the various circumstances that we find ourselves in as da'wah opportunities. Of course, people were arguing, should these American troops have been here in Saudi Arabia and this and that and the scholars and the this and the all kinds of stuff develop. People were complaining, etc. Kufar, etc. It didn't change the reality. They still came and they left. So it was up to us, either we take advantage of the opportunity, since the Muslim world had not taken Islam to America, Allah brought Americans, half a million of them, into the middle of the Muslim world and said, teach them. It's about looking at the glass half full or half empty, isn't it? And 
That's how we have to treat the various dour circumstances that we might find ourselves in. You know, most of you are coming from many different countries in the Muslim world. And there are dawa opportunities in each and every country. And it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to carry the message of Islam to those who haven't heard that message. It is not just a recommended practice, act, to spread the word. It is an obligation. It is on our shoulders. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had told us, Man katama ilman al jamahullah bilijamin min al nar. Whoever hides knowledge, Allah will put a bridle of fire over his head on the day of judgment. And those of you that have studied fiqh, usul fiqh, they know that whenever the consequence of an act is punishment with the hellfire, then that act must be an obligatory act. That to not fulfill it means haram, you have that punishment. It is known. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He said very clearly, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ الْلَّاعِنُونَ Those to whom the clear messages of Islam have come. It has been explained to them. And they hide it from people. Such will be cursed by Allah and cursed by all who would curse. And again in Surah Al-Fiqh, if an act, the consequence of an act is the curse of Allah, because the scholars of Tafsir have explained that the curse is, ref is in reference to a pond of fire in the hellfire, a pit of fire, whale. So if Allah's curse is on a person for an act, it means that that act is haram. It is haram to hide the knowledge of Islam. Now, some people say, well, I'm not hiding it. I'm just not making dawah. Well, hiding can be active or it can be passive. Active or passive. Active, for example, an American comes and asks you about Islam. And you say, no, I'm not going to tell you anything about Islam. You're killing my brothers in Afghanistan. You don't deserve to know anything. <laughs> That's active. Passive is to know this person, to work with him, to go to school with him, to live next to him. This is your neighbor. You talk to him about everything under the sun, everything you talk about, except Islam. You talk about kids, you talk about wives, you talk about vacation, you talk about car, house, the job, your boss, shopping, the best deals, sales. You talk about everything except Islam. You have passively hidden 
Islam from them. By default, you are a hider of Islam. What do you think on the Day of Judgment when we are raised up and that neighbor, that classmate, friend is asked by Allah why he didn't accept Islam, why didn't find he is going to point the finger at you and he's going to say oh Allah he had the knowledge and he talked to me about everything under the sun except Islam please give him ten times the punishment he will curse you he is your friend smiling in your face today on the day of resurrection he will curse you you will be cursed so we have an obligation an obligation to carry the message of Islam to those around us of course some people say well you need to be knowledgeable you don't have something what can you give but Prophet Muhammad had said convey whatever you have learned from me even if it's only a single verse of the Quran one verse قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ we all know. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. One verse. That verse is the answer to all of the false religions on the earth. It addresses the essence of their deviation and their misguidance. That single verse. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Translate this verse. What does Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad mean? Huh? There's no God except Allah? That's La ilaha illallah, man. Come on. Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad. Say. We know Qul means say. Huh? Allahu Ahad. Huh? Huh? There's only one God. He is one. This is a mistake that some people think Kullu Allahu Ahad means one. Allah is one. It's the same as saying Kullu Allahu Ahad. But it's not. Kullu Allahu Ahad is different from Kullu Allahu Wahid. Kullu Allahu Wahid is one, yes. Allah is one. And Al Wahid is among Allah's names. But Al-Ahad has a different meaning. The scholars explain, language and tafsir, that Ahad, when you speak about Ahadiyya, you're talking about the uniqueness of Allah's oneness. It's more than the just one. It is a unique one. So, for example, if somebody says, I have one mobile. That's Wahid. You can have one mobile too. Everybody in the room can have one mobile. But when we use the term Ahad, it means one like whom there is no other. One who is truly unique. Nothing like him. And that's why the whole rest of the surah is explaining how unique Allah is. Allah is Samad. He has no need. Everything depends on him. Lam Yalid. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't give birth. Lam Yalid. Walam Yulad. He's not born. Walam Yakullahu Kufuan Ahad. And there is nothing similar to him. So this verse, Qul Allahu Ahad, it is the response to all of the deviant religions in the world today. 
The biggest one is Christianity. It strikes at the heart of Christianity. Christianity which is about Trinity. God is three in one. And when you ask the average Christian, can you explain to me how God is three in one? They say, <coughs> well, <coughs> you know, an egg, the egg, if you have a boiled egg, you have a shell. Take off the shell. You have the white. Remove the white and you have the yellow of the egg. It's one egg, but it has three parts. It's known as the egg theory. We say, oh, that may be your God. Your God might be an egg God. But for us, our God is one like whom there is no other. There's nothing in this world similar to him. So some will say, <clears throat> well, you know, water. Water can be a liquid. It can be a solid ice. And it can be steam, gaseous, a gas. How about that one? It's known as the water theory. We say, no, 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 no. That's a water god. Your god is a water god. Not ours. Our god is one like whom there is no other. So there really is no explanation for Trinity, how it could be. Some bring out another one, which is a little trickier. They say, you, a man, can be a father, you can be a brother, and you can be a son. How's that one? <laughs> father, brother, and son, all in one. How's that? Okay. What happens when the father dies? Well, both the son and the brother die too. Finish. So, you have a problem here. Doesn't work. Your God is a man God. No, that's not our God. He's like a man. So, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ is the answer. There is nothing similar to him. And that's how they've lost their way. They've made God like his creation. And what has happened to them is that instead of worshiping the God of Jesus, they worship Jesus as God. That's where they ended up. All of the Trinitarian theory and explanations and philosophy, Greek logic and reason, and all of it is used to justify the worship of a man, a human being. So when you're giving dawa <coughs> to people of Christian backgrounds, then you should know that this is where you have to take them. This is the point that you have to cause them to think, to stop and to think. You can talk about all of the other things. They like to talk about hijab. They like to talk about had cutting off hands. They like to talk about polygamy. Or they like to talk about many other topics. But in the end, and of course, when they want to speak about these things, you do have to address their questions, but you have to know that you need to take them back to Allah. Was Jesus God or not? That's where we have to take them. And when you're giving <coughs> dawah to Christians, 
there is a relatively easy way to bring them to this point of understanding. If their background is normal, standard, not hardcore. <clears throat> what Muhammad Sharif used to do is he used to ask the Filipinos and Filipinos accept Islam when compared to other nationalities at a rate of about seven to one. What Muhammad Sharif used to say to them is, <clears throat> do you think that you could become God? Do you think that you could become God? And they would say, no, 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 of course not. Why not? Why couldn't you become God? They would say, because I'm a human being. So he said, he would then ask them, was Jesus Christ a human being? They would say, yeah, he was a human being. So he said, well then, he couldn't have been God. I said, oh, never thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. He couldn't have been God. But there was no chance to think. Most of them are Catholics. They grow up in a very strong Christian environment. You know, things are just poured on them. There's no time to think. If you start to think and question, they're told immediately, don't ask that question. Satan has got you, boy. You know, forget it. Don't read the Bible. They will tell them. Don't read the Bible. It will send you astray. You learn it through us. So, when you bring some simple logic, it's enough. Of course, when you're dealing with somebody who has gone to university, he's gotten education on a higher level, graduate, undergraduate education. He's done philosophy 101. He's done philosophy 101. Now you have a different cup of tea. Because when you say to him, could you be God? Of course, if he says yes, End of conversation. No point going down that road. You've got a maniac on your hands, right? Leave him, find somebody else. Right? Who's still got their heads screwed onto their bodies properly. Right? So he says, uh, yeah, I couldn't be God. No, yeah. Why not? Because I'm human. Human beings can't be God. Then he says, then you ask him, was Jesus a human being? Uh-oh. He realized he got himself in a trap. If he says yes, then he's finished. Because he learned in logic class, a, if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. So he sees what's coming down the line, right? So what does he do? He says, somewhat, what do you mean somewhat? Was he God or was he not God? He was sometimes, or partially, he appeared that way. He, he's found all kinds of other terminologies. He doesn't want to say that he was a man. So you have to deal with him in a different way. Another explanation that Muhammad Sharif used to use for 
basic people, again, the average person. He would say, you know, of course you believe that there is one God. As Christian, you believe there's one God. Three in one, but yet one. One God. There was only one God. They read the verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Jesus said it. It's in the Old Testament. It's known. God is one. So, he would ask them, you know, when cows give birth, you have a little cow called a calf. A cow and a calf. When dogs give birth, you have a little dog called a puppy. The dog and the puppy. When cats give birth, you have a little cat. The cat and the kitten. The little cat is called a kitten. So when God gave birth, what do you have? A little God? So you got a big God and a little God? No, 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 no. But well, what you said? If God gives birth, he can only give birth to a God? Right? Some people who have their head on correctly would say, ah, I never thought about that. Yeah. That's what it means. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that there are two gods. So therefore, God could not have given birth to Jesus. Jesus is not the son of of God. Of course, some Christians will focus on the Son of God thing and they say, but you know, yes, Jesus was the Son of God. And when you mention to them, yeah, but there are many sons of God mentioned in the Bible. Adam is called the Son of God. David, the children of Adam and Eve are called the sons and daughters of God. They said, yes, but it is with a small s. Whereas when it refers to Jesus, it's written with a capital S. Son, the big S. And you say to them, well, you know, the language in which the Gospels are written is Greek. Greek. That wasn't the language of Jesus. That's a whole other story. Jesus didn't even speak Greek. But the Gospels, the oldest manuscripts are in Greek. And the Greek language, like Arabic, does not have capitals. Is there a capital ba? Do we have capital ba's and capital alephs and little alephs? And <laughs> Just aleph, finish. Similarly in Greek, they don't have capitals, big and small letters. So guess what? Somebody played a trick on you. So, <clears throat> the dawa has to be addressed to people according to their level of understanding. How you give dawa to a college graduate is different from how you give dawa to a taxi driver. But know that the message of Islam the message of Islam, because it is the truth, it will win over. Don't be shy. And focus on conveying the message of Islam. Some brothers, when they finally wake up that, hey, we are supposed to be giving da'wah here, the first thing they do is, they see Zakir Naik, Ahmed Didat, and they hear all these quotes from the Bible, so the first thing they do, go buy a Bible and start studying the Bible. No, 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 no. 
So they become experts on the Bible. And when the non-Muslims ask them questions about Islam, they say, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> no, no. Our base, our foundation has to be Islam. We need to learn Islam properly. Have a good understanding of the fundamental teachings, the various areas of Islam. Our duty, our responsibility is to carry that message to them in the best way, with the best language. We don't address them as non-Muslims. You disbelievers, you kuffar, you pagans, yes, they are pagans, they are kuffar, they are disbelievers, but that just closes people's ears. So, better for you to say to them, my dear, use words which are endearing, making people feel comfortable. And we give them the message of Islam where there is supportive evidence from the Bible or elsewhere, we can use that as support. But it shouldn't be the main presentation. Why? Because those people who get off deeply into the Bible, they will end up into a situation where it becomes an issue of interpretation. You say this means this, they say no, it means that. Then where do you go from there? Because for them, they don't have clear guidelines as to meanings, etc. Everybody is free to understand and to interpret things as they wish. So very difficult to pin them down, even with the texts. So, it's best to carry that message across to them. What you do is, instead, remove the confusion, the misunderstandings about Islam. One of my favorite lectures when I give to non-Muslims is called Common Misconceptions About Islam and Muslims. And people are usually interested. Yeah, yeah, we want to know about these things. And you go from talking about Allah to polygamy to terrorism and you explain it to them. Not necessarily that you have to convince them to accept your belief and your practice, but at least that they understand that it is a rational concept. It has reason and logic behind it. Whether they accept it or not is another thing. Because when you speak to them, for example, about polygamy, because that's the first question they like to ask. Why are you Muslims polygamous? And this misunderstanding is so common. I remember meeting a brother in the UK, in London, who had delayed accepting Islam for two years. He had decided to become a Muslim, but he delayed becoming a Muslim for two years. And I asked him, why? He said, because... I was under the impression that when a man becomes a Muslim, he must have four wives. And I was happy with the one wife, and you know, that was enough for me. It's common misunderstanding. So, you can clarify about polygamy, not necessarily saying that, yes, you should be polygamous. No, understand. Islam did not bring polygamy into the world. It is not that the world was a monogamous world and here comes Muhammad وسلم, with polygamy. You know? No, that's not how it was. The whole world is polygamous. That's how it is. Human beings in all societies, in all corners of the world throughout history 
from as far back as we can go to the pharaohs, to the Mesopotamians, all over the world, in the jungles of the Amazon, Borneo, people are polygamous. The anthropologists, they even have a Darwinian explanation of why human beings, men, are polygamous. Yeah. You can sit with them and they will explain to you why. They say, when you look, because they always like to go back to the animal kingdom. Right? When they want to explain about why we do what we do, they go back and look at the animals and say, see, that's why they do it and that's why we do it. So, what they do is they go back and they say, well, look. Look at the Lion King. The Lion King. He has all of the female lions with him. There are other male lions and they're always prowling around and he just beats them off and he keeps... What's happening here? They said, this is an evolutionary principle to ensure survival of the fittest. How? Well, the fact that he is the Lion King, he's able to beat up every, uh, everybody else, means he is the fittest. So by controlling the females, the whole next generation are all his kids, it means they will be the strongest. That is the explanation. So they say that's the same reason, because human beings are really only talking animals anyway. Same thing happening. So anyway, the point is, after explaining that Muslims did not introduce polygamy to the world, we explained to them that in fact Islam came and organized it, put rules, regulations, rights, obligations, set these things. It, it didn't leave it as it was, wide open. Anybody could have as many wives as possible and no. The kids were not considered to be the children of the father, it's a, no. It is the right of the woman who is the second wife to be treated the same as the first wife. Her children are his children. So it protects the rights of the children. They will inherit as, he, as the other children of the first wife inherit. So you explain to them the logical system that is there. And you point out to them, think about it. In America, and it does happen from time to time that there are people who are polygamous. You know, a man, he will live near the border of a state. He has a wife in one state and a wife in the other state. He's a traveling salesman, so he has excuse for being away. So he has a wife and he maintains the whole family. Not until he dies and the word gets to the other family and they meet each other. Oh, all these years, this man had been married to two women, raising a family here and there. So think about that. That man is now called a bigamist, a criminal. If he were caught alive, he could be jailed. But if they were girlfriends, mistresses, no problem. No problem. He can have as many mistresses, girlfriends as he wants, as many illegitimate children as he wishes, no problem. In fact, they will praise him, write stories about him. He's virile. He's a man. But what is the logic here? The man who wants to do it right, looking after people's rights and the children and everything else, you call him a criminal, you put him in jail, and the one who is exploiting women and abusing them and the children, you... It's illogical. It is illogical. Christianity is not monogamous. They say, yes, it was. No, it isn't. You just go back in their history, 
Go back into the Bible and there's clear evidence of polygamy. Some women will ask after that, okay, we can understand that, makes sense. Many times I've heard this, they'll say, yes, it's quite reasonable and logical, though I don't want it for myself, but I can understand, you know, uh, polygamy in this context. But, what about women? Why can't the woman have four husbands like the men have four wives? That's what concerns me. Fairness here. Fairness. Why not? Well, we explain to them that, listen, if a man has four wives and he has children, the children know who their father is. If a woman has four husbands and she gets pregnant and has a child and the child asks, who is my father? She says, one of these four guys. <laughs> you think that's a satisfying answer? Would you be happy to be told that your father is one of these four? No. Human nature rejects that. You want to know who your father is. They say, okay, we have DNA testing. Okay, DNA testing is not 100%. Not only that, how many people have access to DNA testing? A fraction of humankind. So Islam is a practical religion. It deals with the norms of society. Anyway, we see in general that human societies have a majority of females. Wherever you go in the world, women are surplus. Polygamy is one of the ways by which they may be integrated within the family structure because every woman, it is natural for her to want to be a part of a family, to want to be a mother, to want to be a wife. So this is the means for integrating them into the society. Now, if a woman takes four husbands, is that solving the problem or increasing the problem? She's now taking four men out of circulation. So there's more women. The ratio of women to men has increased. More women. And with the spread of homosexuality today in the world, the number of available men have dropped even more. So women having four husbands doesn't solve the problem. Not only that, but all the studies that have been done on females and the nature of females, it's the nature of a woman to be with one man. That's her nature. It's the nature of man to be with more than one woman. I know you don't want to hear that. I know you don't really want to hear that. No, not my husband. Because every woman likes to think, not my husband. You don't know what he talks about when he sits with the guys. When he's with you, yeah, yeah, one wife. No, no, I'm never thinking of When he's with the guys, oh boy. I wish I could have a second wife, you know. <laughs> That's the reality. That's the reality. You don't find women sitting together and saying, I wish I could have a couple of husbands, you know, three or four. It just doesn't happen. It's not their nature. So, there are logical, biological, sociological, demographic reasons for polygamy. Allah has made it a part of the nature of human society. So, so you give, this is the explanation that you give. And then you bring it back to Allah. It is Allah who made people that way. There is a reason for it. It serves a purpose. There is a logic behind it, etc. So, in this way, you tackle the various 
issues that they raise and there are no end of them. If you want to help prepare yourself, <clears throat> uh, there is online a university which I set up back in 2007. It's called the Islamic Online University. And there we have free courses, absolutely free, costs you nothing. Diploma courses, absolutely free. Their course there is they're called the DTC course, that is Dawa training course. Go and take that. There is a course there called Contemporary Issues, where I deal with all of the major questions that are usually asked. It's free. Go and get yourself prepared from that perspective while preparing yourself with the Dean. And there are courses there which deal with the various aspects of the deen, from aqidah to fiqh to hadith to tafsir, even Arabic is there, it's free. And there's also a BA course there, which we started uh, last year, which is tuition free. There's no tuition costs, it's virtually free. BA, which it has uh, a um, accredited degree given, from a university in the Philippines. We are linked to a university in the Philippines, in southern Philippines, in Mindanao. And they issue, will issue the degrees for us. And that degree is recognized by the Ministry of Education in the Philippines. So there is available this degree in Islamic studies, a very comprehensive degree. Go to the website, www.islamiconlineuniversity.com dot com and take advantage of the knowledge we're going to stop here now and uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, of course the questions uh, are in the written form I hope you brought papers and really I guess papers should have been distributed amongst you they were distributed okay that's good so those of you who had questions, you've sent your questions in. Now we will go on to the questions.